to Talk Time. Now, this week, we are going to discuss a variety of topics. And that is because we have a very special personality in the studio uh, who can talk about many things. And indeed, we are not going to let him off you know, when we know that we can take so much from him. So this week we'll be talking a bit about education, we'll be talking a bit about the history of this country, we'll probably be talking about journalism and any other issues that come up. Welcome to Talk Time. Well, hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And as I indicated this week, we're talking about a variety of issues. We'll be talking about history, we'll be talking about journalism, we'll be talking about teaching journalism, and we'll be talking about education generally and many other issues, the 1966 school and whatever. And it is my distinguished pleasure to introduce Professor Nana Esrifi Kunduya. I'm sure that many of you know Professor Nana Esrifi Kunduya. Uh, I first met him when he was working at the Ghana News Agency. And uh, since then, he's, he's, he's moved on, done many things, including teaching at the African University, uh, uh, African University of Communication, University of Communications, AUCC. CC. Yes. Yeah, communication. Welcome, Pro. My pleasure, Kwesi. Pro. Mm. Now, Pro, this morning I just saw the cover of a book that you authored. And it appears to be about Ghana's first coup. What is the inspiration for the book? Oh, um, one, I realized that we have lost a lot of our history. There is always the dispute about whether the books that were there for posterity were ordered to have been burnt or they burnt themselves, not the possibility. <laughs> But um, it's always controversy. And um, since I had been a, a witness to what had gone on before and within that period, though at that time I was not in country, I was representing my country outside, I was very well abreast with times and I kept my notes. And so I decided that I will. Mind you, I had done the Third Republic. This should have preceded the Third Republic. Mm -hmm. I was doing them in sequence. But uh, something else happened. I was disappointed by um, our people. The so-called publishing houses in this country, we've got to take a second in-depth look at them. We are now crying for books. And when the contract is given to other people from outside, our very people complain. It is their conduct. You know, a publishing house, as you and I know, has quite a lot mm -hmm. on its plate to do. But as we see, it seems to me that those who run around claiming they were publishers are just jobbers. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, if you're not careful, you hand your manuscript over to them. Um, they play toy with you. And at the end, if you don't put your foot down, you might indeed lose your uh, manuscript. And I almost lost the manuscript of this one that you're talking about, mm -hmm. though I kept hold of the 
the first, that one, the Third Republic. So, mm -hmm. so since I was bent on recalling, because you never know when you're going to go. Mm -hmm. So what is left in your head, you might share it with post posterity. And it's posterity and the vacuum in our story for that same posterity that inspires me which inspire me to uh, continue. I must say that I have just finished editing the final uh, right of the second, from the Second Republic to the SMC2 close. Mm -hmm. And I hope that I will re-edit the final type out copy. And then find a, um, a prospective uh, publisher to um, put it out. I do it not because I want the money, but I do it because A, I have a duty to uh, God and my conscience and our people today and tomorrow. You remember Power Grant said at his inaugural speech uh, at Salt Pond of the AU, uh, UGCC, fought, um, August 1947, finally that Everyone present there should remember what they were doing that day was not for themselves, but was for posterity. And how posterity would simply view what they had done and look back to draw their inspiration, or at least to get the information right, mm -hmm. so that the posterity can go on and build on from there. Mm -hmm. So it's part and parcel of the inspiration that uh, cut puts me or pushes me on um, relentlessly. What, what is the import of this book? The, what is this book saying? It is saying exactly what happened as I saw mm -hmm. during the period after the coup, 1966 to 1969. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I caught an interview you had with Tony Deku. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in the very first first chapter or second chapter there and interpret what he says, what you ask, provide the historical background from which perspective, from which you were coming mm -hmm. and then his responses uh, to pigeonhole if there were any contradictions with the, any of the others that were issued uh, by the NLC and then the conduct of the NLC of government themselves and how at the end of the day they themselves were pushed out by the very people who had used them to overthrow the First Republic. One very interesting thing which uh, Mr. A.K. Deku said was that he thought Nkrumah was a very good man. Yes, he did. I was pleasantly surprised that if you thought he was a very good man, why did you join that? Mm -hmm. And it takes my mind back to literature. Yeah. Um, in Mark Anthony's oration, funeral oration, mm -hmm. he described the noble Buddhist as, as he is the only one who did what they did mm -hmm. for the sake of Rome mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to uh, great Caesar. Yeah. So in probability, that he did. But you know, if you go back to the interview that you had with him, very insightful. At certain points when I was watching and replaying the tape, I, I thought that you were not, you didn't want to pursue or pin him down to certain points, particularly where he, would con he was constantly saying that I'm not prepared to say, that I'm not prepared to say, that I'm not prepared to say. Unfortunately, He's gone with that. Nobody else knows. And this is our problem. That's another reason yeah. I am thinking that it behooves me to put down anything that I, I, that I come by. And I feel it's worthwhile posterity's information as well. Because there he's gone. And previously you know that all our great people, with the exception of Osajifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, none of them left this country with any book at all. I was arguing that other day that, look, if all the great judges in the past had put down their thoughts and trials that had given them trials and how they had come by it, mm -hmm. our legal system does, would not have to go to so-called historical 
cases from Britain and elsewhere to make their submissions at the bar and to make their pronouncements from the bench. Mm -hmm. You understand it? Mm -hmm. Because there is for me a, a crop of high intelligence in their judgments. Some you can't find the way we keep our archives. Others you can find in snippets. But even then, what you can get hold of is great wisdom which surpass for me. Mm -hmm. It's my, for me, great judgments which the, the legal fraternity will call landmark decisions. And I believe that uh, that again is important for us. We who come by information, especially that for posterity, that which will give lessons, whether they learn or they don't learn, but they are witnesses in the cabinet or in some machine. Right today you have the what, the Google or whatever that you've got um, to find out. It's a shame when you put students to work and about Ghana, Africa, they have to go to Google, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, you, you, you cry in your heart yeah. that he sits there, does not know about a confinery, mm. does not know which roles people played and we have been so ungrateful to them. So I, I, I do hope that I realize there's a new crop of um, younger generation trying to bring up these, mm -hmm. but there are only a few and they don't live in this country. And you wonder uh, why the others here. You've got a whole history departments uh, with a bevy of um, scholars and we're not writing. Right? It's, it's such a shame, but maybe something's got to be done uh, in, in the very near future so that um, we can. I noticed that unfortunately, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, I'll explain, fortunately that some apparent sense appeared to take in the upper hand at, in our education system whereby um, history is being restored as a core subject. I never could understand it. You've got, you know, <coughs> postgraduate students mm -hmm. do not know their own history, let alone the history of Africa, because history was an option. Mm -hmm. So it's a splendid idea that um, it's being restored as a core subject, but then shortage of books, shortage of books. But also a lot of people have raised issues about the content. The they curriculum. have. I have found that. Mm -hmm. I listened to a great debate by one of the FM stations mm -hmm. that very week. I concur with some of the misgivings that were. Mm -hmm. And I've taken a closest look at the whole content of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think it was because the alarm that is being raised is proper, but I think it's gone to a, it has gone to a crescendo simply because of the examness, I repeat, mm -hmm. the examness of some seeming design to mm -hmm. twist the history of the country. Mm -hmm. And that is why people are so angry about that. But looking at it very soberly, you can forgive them. And, and, and yes, and you can. Because truth is one. Yeah. And truth is right. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing you can do about truth. No, ma no matter how you seek to twist truth, mm -hmm. it will survive. Yeah. So that is not my main concern. My main concern is the enormity of contents crowded into that schedule for basic one to six. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that probably I might engage the people who were the panel and listen to them. Throughout the debates have not, seems to me, mm -hmm. uh, invited any of the people who were the panel, who were the panel um, to speak to why they put X instead of Y. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's appropriate that if we want to get the the minds of those who would write, rewrite the history, mm -hmm. um, 
are not twisted, they should themselves um, be able to explain the lights from which they advise themselves to inculcate that. Much of it, you know, is civics, more than history they want to be written. Mm -hmm. And you and I, I'm sure, were brought up in uh, civics. Civics is very simple. How I, as a citizen, know what my country is, where my country is coming from, and what are the aspirations of my country, mm -hmm. and what are my responsibilities mm -hmm. in promulgating and defending that responsibility with honesty. Now, Prof, you've written about the 1966 coup. Yes. You've written about the Second Republic, yes. even though it's not published yes. yet, I understand. You've written also about the Third Republic. Yes. So, is there something that runs through the First Republic to the Third Republic? Anything? There's a great deal. Something that, that is common. Uh, the common thing is, uh, well, I wouldn't say common thing. The common things are a rundown of the system and abnegation of the fact that I am an African and a Ghanaian. And thirdly, the conceivable attempt to raise egos where they do not exist. And that pollutes our history. It is that which I'm against, and it is that which I've been writing recently about in my columns for the mm -hmm. Times and the Catholic Standard. You know, um, I do hope and pray that this new enterprise is going to provide us with a real compendium of the reality and truthfulness of our history because it's important for posterity. Truth is that, I must warn this, truth is that if we twist it today and posterity found out, they would drop us into the garbage of history for good. And I, I don't think anyone, you and, I, of course, you and I won't want that, but I, I don't know about the others. Um, <laughs> it will be intellectual um, suicide if you know it, and for some other reasons, parochial, narrow, mm -hmm. or broad, or for what my old lady, God bless her soul, where she is, told to me the, the stomach, you know, mm -hmm. um, we tend to not be able to call a spade a spade. And that is another issue that is eroding the fabric of this society. Prof, you, you were known as a journalist. How did you get involved with journalism? What were the motivating factors? Was it accidental? Was it deliberate? How did you become a journalist? Oh, you know, at college, we had a college magazine, and I started reading and writing. In those years, um, it was compulsory that you write. It was compulsory that every form, by the way, we did terms, first, second, and third. And even that, we couldn't do much out of it. I mean, it derives from the um, Ariel Butler's famous Education Act of, um, mm -hmm. how to call the date, right? Mm -hmm. And what we did um, after that, uh, culminating in the disowning of our own history and destroying it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so after college, I came to broadcasting. And first of all, I was maybe virtually involved with programs. And there you write and speak, right? And then in the latter stages began to be absorbing into the newsroom itself, thanks to the patronage of uh, the late then deputy head of news, Eric Ajololo. Mm -hmm. Everyone called him Uncle <coughs> Eric. Mm -hmm. I was kind of his adopted son. And I knew the beginning of the setting up of the newsroom as such in, in broadcasting house 
where the BBC brought a man called Ian Wilson, and then he later had to get an African. They couldn't get any until Eric Ajololo arrived, and, uh, but Eric himself was not really a trained journalist. He had trained in printing. He would confess to the newsroom at large. Any day he said, look, boys, you are doing your job, do it, and you will be remunerated properly, right? Eric never failed. But of course, he also gave himself the chance to improve and become one, uh, such that he could you know, be an, an efficient editor of any news copy in the newsroom up in BH2 and BH3 until he left. So um, I transited from GBC to the Ghana News Agency. I joined the desk straight away. And um, I believe I rose through the ranks. The editing desk. The editing desk. Yes. And I believe I rose through the ranks by merit. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, I had to go abroad to study. And in the course of it, then, um, having done bits and pieces, there was the vacancy. Um, and I was asked. In fact, I came back home on transfer to Accra. Though in between, I had been called back home to, because of the courses that I did to see about a few things in the newsroom and editorial setup. I had been doing this report and then go back. No. I had come back home as if it lived permanently once and for all, having done 10 straight years as um, a correspondent. And, uh, in the UK? In the UK. Um, I was covering East and West Europe with North Africa as and when. <clears throat> so um, something tragic happened in my absence at the office in London. So I had to be dispatched at um, two days notice to go back to London to go to pick up the pieces. And so I went back. So I enjoyed my stint and I believe I didn't fail my country or my What was this tragic thing that happened in the office in the UK? Oh, the colleague I left who was in charge died suddenly. Oh. In fact, he's the elder brother of your present Chief Justice. Mm. Mm. Okay. And that's why you had to go back to the That's UK why I had to go back, yes. So. Well, viewers, we are talking to Professor Nana Esripi Kunria. It's many things, many, many, many things. News agency journalist, broadcast journalist, teacher of journalism, and many things, author, and so on. Um, we'd like to take a short break here. And when we come back, I'd like to find out about the relevance of news agency work. Is news agency work still relevant? You know, what was the idea behind the formation of the Ghana News Agency by the Nkrumah government? Short break. Did they harm you? They just went they were about to. They hit the siren and bolted. Scout the area. You don't have security cameras? They stole everything. I thought you used ghost cameras from security. Security warehouse? Yes, you should. They couldn't have gotten away the way they did without either being electrocuted or being caught on a CCTV camera. Well, hello and welcome back to Talk Time. Uh, we are in conversation with Professor Nana Esifi Kundria. Professor Nana Esifi Kundria now teaches lectures at the African University of Communication Studies. Uh, he's been at the Ghana News Agency. He's been at the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. He's actually writing books. I just saw one of the books he's published, and I'm going to read it 
before the weekend, you know, it's about 1966 school and so on. And we are so privileged to have such a distinguished teacher and journalist with us in the studio. Now, sir, what led to the establishment of Ghana News Agency? What, what were we trying to do when we established the Ghana News Agency? Very well, Chris. You stir the hornet's nest, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ghana News Agency was a direct sequel to the establishment of the uh, Ghana uh, Institute of Journalism. I wonder how many people know the story that led to the establishment of the Institute. I'll tell it briefly. At that time, CPP ministers were making gaffes and Kwame, I mean Osaji Fulte Kwame Nkrumah, was finally disturbed and was pushed to ask a question to a small group of the party hierarchy. Don't the ministers have PRs? They said, Osaji Fulte, no. He said, what? No training institution in this country for... They said, yes, sir. So he called one or two of them. I, I think um, Ford and that West Indian um, who read the news had broadcast thing. Um, his name is Khan. And then um, there was Kofi Bako, Kweku's father. He instructed them to go and establish a training institution. There he understood that the people that were on the local press, mm -hmm. print and the mono radio, most had not been trained at all. But they were doing such a marvelous professional job. If I take part one or two of the, the, the copy or the writings from those people, some only stand at seven, others secondary school dropouts, no degrees, no nothing, and you compare it today, I cry. Standard quality, English construction, all of it. Never mind. So they went about. So they had to invite a chap from advice given by Sir Christopher Chancellor, who was then the managing director of Reuters London, mm -hmm. was Nkrumah's friend. And so they recommended Reuters, right? From Reuters, they recommended a man called Macmillan. And Macmillan came to Ghana to establish the Ghana Institute of Journalism. The idea or the bargain that was struck was that entry requirements were going to be in favor of those who were on the job mm -hmm. locally. Because you couldn't see what the matter was wrong with them. The only thing is that they needed the, the lecture hall rationalization of what they did. Otherwise, they worked mechanically and they worked practically excellent, par excellence. Mm -hmm. So that was why it was um, tilted in favor of those on board. It's now been turned to the extent that now even those on board cannot because they are asking you to produce this and that and that. <laughs> you know, journalism, up to that time, there was a bevy of thinking in this country that it didn't need any training. You are imbued. Mm -hmm. It's something that's in, innate in you. You can be tapped by an elder, and you are at it. And most of them, yes, in those days, besides the elders who established newspapers and the rest of them, from Bannerman Brothers through um, Hutton Brew, they never went to any school, really. They were professionals, doctors, schoolmasters, teachers, right, lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who started and established it, right? So the coming on board of training as an aid memoir was the idea. Soon at this time in our progress as a country, there was the need in Broadcasting House for an external service. The external service then had to be established as an adjunct to prosecuting the independence and encouraging fellow African 
Africans who were struggling for their independence. Ghana had become the mecca for independence for Africa and the mecca of learning for the rest of the world. Indeed, they came in their drones to Flagstaff House and the rest of it. They sat in capitals and waited what was said from Accra to fashion policy. GBC external service pioneered that and they did very well. It's now been killed so badly. It was killed after the coup. No one knows why, mm -hmm. but it's, it's important. All I knew was it was said to be one of the instruments of Kwame Nkrumah, so finish it. Mm -hmm. So they finished it. Now, before we went off air uh, and you signed off, um, you broke off. You talked about why Ghana News Agency was And I've said that Ghana News Agency was a sequel, direct sequel to. Osajifu realized that apart from voice, we should also be seen to be reporting ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you remember when he, he inaugurated GNA, uh, GIJ, mm -hmm. and GNA, he re echoed what was said then and this time that he was looking forward to the day where any copy from Ghana news agency that dropped on anywhere of the world news news editorial desk once it bore the insignia of gna will not be challenged anywhere because it ought to be trusted as the african reporting from his african black pair of eyes mm -hmm. unquote and so gna was established you know if you go into a salam down from the cathedral mm -hmm. you've got this gin buildings there the first one was not gins it belonged, I believe, to the Bax Martis, right? It's on top of that that we found a place to inaugurate GNA. Wow. It was later that GNA was moved to the beach head there close to Bedimpo Memorial Hall, adjacent to the Accra Traditional Council buildings there. And GNA lived in those um, makeshift uh, building, more or less kiosk, right? With corrugated iron sheets and the rest of it. it was comfortable anyway working in that in those in that situation we simply enjoyed doing what we we're doing because we were imbued with telling our story and we told it so well that we became highly competitive on the international circuit they would want to read gna copy as much as they would want to listen to gbc external to make policies to inform them to what next to do and so those years, yes, Kwame achieved it with just that single masterstroke, right? Mm -hmm. um, GBC external and GNA, no, gave us voice and it huge presence on the international information circuit with governments and with the peoples of those places, right? So this was the reason. Now. You were asking again in that you know, quick summary for the break, is, it, is news agency relevance today? I'll say, why, why not? Reuters exists, CNN exists, um, Jazeera exists, the, all of them exist. Why not? It's relevant. The unfortunate thing that has happened to DNA in this country is that when the coup occurred, there was a design to kill DNA as well. All the outposts, London, New York, Nairobi, Lagos, were run down. Only London survived for a while. The rest of them were run down because they were neglected. JNA was thrown into huge debts. I attended several rescheduling of debt payments for JNA. Now, the result is what you have. You, do, you are not seeing a copy that resembles you know, a news agency writing. It's a specialized area, if you understand it. And the in, in training institutions, because one, there's no staff, two, they are not aware, and three, nobody cares, they are not. At GIJ, 
where I taught, when I had resigned from Ghana News Agency, 1977, I, we met with teaching broadcast journalism, print journalism, and wire service, which is news agency journalism. The training institutions don't seem to me to have any idea whatsoever about this distinction. And in any case, GNA had become a passed on albatross, a kind of take it or leave it, jeans and sphinx, right? It's supposed to be a state owned thing. And they are suffering from anemia of state funding, just as the rest of them. Graphic seems to be the only one which found its bearings out and can find its head above the waters. Um, the times she started with so much, you should know, debts, um, GNA, no better. So, inside there, the know-how is not there. The people who were the rump had all gone, or they had, mind you, they were, they were some were arrested mm -hmm. after the coup, and it was tough. Yeah. You understand it? Mm -hmm. So this deterred anybody else who would want to join the news agency. That is important. The same thing happened in Broadcasting House. There, appointments of people or persons who knew nothing at all about broadcasting or journalism were appointed to the top. So what happens? Those who would find their exit found their exit. Those who wouldn't, wouldn't and beneath, <coughs> right, decided to fold their arms and watch on. They brought you in. I said, "All right, carry on, carry on." In India, in India, just understand it. So, um, and over the years, there has been that deterioration. Incidentally, somewhere around between 2000 and 2004, so there was rumor that GNA was being prepared to be sold to private investor. Mm -hmm. No, I fought it. I and a few others, we fought it. And they backed out, all right? But that is what is left of GNA. News agency is most important because one, you cannot deploy all your persons from the center through the country. And GNA gave this country blanket coverage. Mm -hmm. And blanket coverage of Ghana and Africa from Accra to the world, right? GNA was carrying that young man's career. And he told the story from, and our, he told own the story from our own perspectives. You understand it? I mean, why did we not? And why don't we admire this? Why do we have? And the greatest mind of Osajifu was simple. That the African can do it on his own. And that's it from his own mores. Mm -hmm. and not from copying, just as in our education, right? He said we were made to behave apes mm -hmm. of Englishmen. And so right now, some of us don't know whether we are African, Ghanaians, or we are whitey. As for the children that are being born outside, they are, their case is pitiful because they don't know who they are, but they bear Ghanaian names. Yeah. They bear Fanti and Fee names. And if you ask them, who gave you that as Santua name? Well, my mom, <laughs> my dog. Does it have any meaning? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't belong there. Mm -hmm. If you look at what's happening to footballers, right? And yet without the Ducky footballers, those English teams and those continental teams will not win laurels. And so we're not. What's wrong with us? What's wrong? Now, Prof, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the lowering of standards in the practice of journalism. You teach journalism yes. and you practice journalism. Mm -hmm. Is there some truth? There's, in the claim? There's, there's total truth. The degeneration started not yesterday. And I dislike pigeonholing it at 66. Because at 66, that is after the coup, all of them who were taught to be 
CPP quote and and unquote there was a deliberate attempt to push them out mm -hmm. and the rest of them who were not known facially decided to um, treat themselves like a multitude said when the enemy advances we we take cover when he relaxes we harass and when he panics we attack and pounce and rout mm -hmm. you see they took that I don't know whether they knew that, that was what they were doing, but that is what happened. Mm -hmm. Until they were look, they looked elsewhere and went away out, away altogether from journalism, and so that was the beginning of it. There ought to be a continuum in journalism, and that continuum depends on the standards that have been set of old, and the new generation will have to look at those standards and build on. That is how you develop in every situation, nation, institution. But once that vacuum occurred, and then the education system began to deteriorate or to be diluted, my mom and her sisters and all my aunties, and I was not brought up to call them aunties, they were my mummies, right? And my uncles, they were my daddies. Look, they were taught. My mom's people, they were taught domestic science. Mm. Then you go and borrow the American terminology. For his sake, sake, what does it mean? <laughs> uh, home economics. The girls can't boil an egg. They can't do a flip. They can't make jam from orange and the peels. They can't ladder a, a socks that is thread. You call it home economics, right? I've not spoken about, you know, as for the cooking. Mm -hmm. I always remember there was um, this folklore people from uh, Cromancy who played a song called Adjoa Misa. I beg, if any Adjoa Misa is alive, I don't mean you. <laughs> we beg, you know, so Adjoa Misa, Babesi, Onimunkwa, Adjoa Misa. No. You know, that is today. Mm -hmm. Take away? Come on. And they come along holding certificates of what? Home economics. And you give the, the girl money to go to the market, it comes, cigar wire shot. <laughs> <laughs> Can't manage it. And you know, their mother's mothers were able, without going to school, they could manage the home. So if you really want home economics, that is the managerial side of it, and, you know, and the application of it. But it's not there. So you see, what those borrowing of titles have done to our existence, mm -hmm. right? To the extent that some people say that, um, what about English? My God, at every form in the secondary school, each term, Apart from the English literature and the English, you will be made to read three supplementary textbooks. And you'll be, you'll be tested on that every term. So at the end of a term three, that is at the end of a year, you have read how many books? Nine, Nine supplementary. You learn the English language because that is what you are going to um, have to work with. Where is it now? Now, if you look at... I'm sorry, but I've got to... If you look and listen to the English the teachers themselves speak to these kids in the classroom or the lecture hall, do you expect them to? Yeah. You understand it? So really, absolutely, the standards started drooping and has drooped so badly that it is very difficult. Because well, see, look, a postgraduate, you ask a postgraduate to write a half a page, A4, you will bleed every line. And they come along with first class, second uppers. There's something wrong we've got to investigate. We've got to put right. You understand it? Mm. It's boiled down to jokes in this country. Oh, well, you'll get a piece of paper if you know 
in Ghana, if you know the ways and means, mm -hmm. and I thought ways and means was ap applying only to football <laughs> and the and, and gerrymandering of football, <laughs> but now it applies to education as well. Everything. So it, it, it is true, and uh, my heart bleeds for it. Uh, I hope that we will try to make that also. It is a core subject, but I think the fault lies with the foundation of the people who come along mm -hmm. and the teacher. Where are the teacher training colleges? Yeah. Are we training teachers at all? The missionary schools or the missionaries in the institutions had teacher training colleges. Mm -hmm. And they were taught A to Z. So in our day, maybe it's the, the college development, if that is development, I'm take it. But I would prefer that one, that where the teacher alone can teach a class, A to Z subject, mm -hmm. and perfectly well, with music, yeah. literature, civics, geography, history, mathematics, English, right? Mm -hmm. And very well. The other day I worked to a bookshop a year ago in uh, Britain. It was in the archive side of that bookshop on Tottenham Court Road, and I found a book we used at the secondary school, Tropical Hygiene for Schools. Mm -hmm. I loved. The man came and said, sir, why are you? I said, well, I, I remembered my school days. <laughs> did, they, did you? I said, yes. Yeah. We were made to read it, Tropical yeah. Hygiene for Schools. Yeah. 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 That alone was enough to put you fairly conversant and on a platform to take on at the secondary level all the divisions in science, physics, chemist, chemistry, and biology and zoology. Where have you gone with it? So for me, the thing about this new education curriculum, whatever they want to call it and want to do it, the only thing I have is that um, it's worth the alarm being you know, sounded, but it depends on how we approach the rewriting, mm -hmm. and it depends on who is going to teach what. It seems to me, no matter what is written, the teachers are not there. So you've got to come along as a policy with the teacher training specifically for history, because now they've divided into history teacher, economics teacher, geography teacher, and Ponya Papa. So, you know, um, you, you have to contend with that. Because without that, then you're going to raise the books there, and there'll be no, you know, real teachers to teach it. Somebody was saying that, uh, oh, they never read history, but they were able to teach history. It's a lie, because <laughs> when you were coming up, you were taught history. Yeah. And it's in you. That imbuement is not anymore there. Mm. And these kids are suffering. But we've got to have pity on them and pity on uh, the posterity and society and think about how we recoup, bring them to par. It's, it's, a, it's a huge task. But we've got to put mind to it. Not a mind to it that we want to raise some persons above other, others of the historically. Well, we want to understand our past and to use it as a guide into the future. To the future, that's all. That's all. Well, viewers, you're talking to Professor Nana Esifi Kulia, a teacher, a journalist, and many more authors. So, um, we're going to take a very, very short break. And when we come back from the break, and I want to find out a little more about who Professor Nana Esrifi Kumia is. Who is he? What has made him what he is today? Short break. Yes, Dad. Everything has been installed. Yes. Okay. I will be fine, Dad. Yeah, for this debate tonight, Charlie Guy, the Kiplunko, go do the far job. 
Charlie, high tech. She didn't lie bad. It could happen tonight. This is no fence. Smart choice. I guess you have some footage for me there. Crystal clear picture. Pause. I think I know this man. He has a long history with robbery and rape. You are fortunate to have equipped your house with gadgets from Security Warehouse. Call it in. We'll begin the investigation from here. Control, come over. Well, hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And we are in conversation with Professor Nana Esipi Kundia, a lecturer at the AUCC. Um, he used to work with the Ghana News Agency. That's where I first met him. And he taught me a lot in news agency reporting. Uh, he's worked with the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. He's taught at the Ghana Institute of Journalism and is writing books, one of which I intend to read before the week ends. Um, sir, who are you? God's own creature, a very incorrigible Roman Catholic, born bred, and someone grateful to God that he let others open doors for me. He gave me the head to learn. And I never let those people down, nor myself down. I come from royalty in Elmina, as the name reveals. I'm sure that most of the kids, when you talk, tell them, who do you think I come from? This is my name. They can't place you in Ghana today. It's a shame. But you ought to know a selfie and Kondia come from nowhere but other than Edna. Edna. Anyway, so... Um, I am a grant by lineage because my mother is grant. And uh, my daddy, he died too early. In fact, I never saw him. Uh, it was my mother and Pa who really, is her father who really saw me through. I'm grateful to them. And then some good teachers, you know. When I was supposed to be going to school, I was a very short, tiny person. I don't think I've grown any bigger. <laughs> very short, but in th those were the years that you had to put your hand this way to, and you know, realize, they say that you, have, you are ripe to go to school, mm -hmm. class one. My mother, being a Methodist, wanted me to go to a Methodist school. So they took me to Methodist school under the old girls' high school. I think the school is still there. We met a teacher, Fletcher. I couldn't. My hand couldn't. And the old lady was frightened. <laughs> and I couldn't. So for that reason, teacher Fletcher would not admit me. It was later that somebody else saw me in a Roman Catholic elementary school. I was you now um, teacher Bafo it was. Mm -hmm. Um, he said, no, this young man, you know. So without going through that height text or whatever, they, they put me in class one, Jubilee School, 1942-43. And something else happened. At that time, the Roman Catholic fathers, the white fathers, were building schools and parishes. So they were building a new school, a month for and so we who lived a little away from Jubilee School um, had to be moved to, uh, to start a mumful. I didn't have to be at a mumful, but I said to myself, childishly, what? I've carried sand, I've carried water, I've carried stones to build that school. No, I'll also go in there. <laughs> so a mumful school was opened from Jubilee School. My name was neither in Jubilee School Register Class 2 or Amalfo Class 2. So I sat there, and Teacher Bafo kept me in there. Until then that they took me on to Class 3. It was Class 3 then that my name got in the books. And sorry, they kept jumping me. 
-hmm. until um, standard four to, to six, where my mother said, no, don't do it. Let him go through it. So I went through it and went, got this scholarship to St. Augustine's, went through St. Augustine's, joined GBC, um, and then transferred to GNA and then off to Britain uh, purposely to pursue further studies. And then finally became a GNA correspondent. Um, in fact, I married in, in, in London. Um, I think I was too old for today's age group to get <laughs> married. This is 65, if you consider a person born in 1936, marrying in 1965, you see. But it was all caution. So what makes me, as a matter of fact, is all the opportunities that I have had and had determined not to let them down or let myself down and persevered learning. I'm still learning. And that Can is what is made me. put in a political pigeonhole? Is that possible? Um, I am a, a political historian and I want to remain that there um, to be able to exercise my right of independent mindedness as I do now. Um, of course, in this country, I know I carry a certain label uh, uh, as this country has become rotten in terms of label. As soon as you begin to criticize or something you say is, is critical, they put you in a label. Whilst you are not, you understand? It's simply that your ideas may coincide with what that particular labeling, ideologically or you know, political party-wise, is tilting. But really, I would want to remain um, as my education has, has led me, a political historian, um, a teacher, and I occupy the chair as the chair of journalism at AUCC. I'm grateful for the authorities for having me there, and I'm grateful especially to the kids. You have some, I met one young lady and a young man, and this is my lot, Chrissy. Everywhere I go in the media system, Outside of other people who are not in the media, but they kind of give me that respect. I'm grateful to all of them. I can't say thank you, but I will use the advantage of propinquity to say thank you all for giving me that little, you know, honor. Um, virtually in the newsroom in broadcasting house, for example, close to 90% of them have come through my hand from GIJ right through... Uh, AUCC, which started as AIJC to become a university. And I'm, I'm grateful to, to God for that. I'm grateful to the youngsters themselves that they are carrying on what they learned. And oftentimes, I know I was very hard, and I remain hard. You will not write, you know, the ghost and, and for me to allow you to get away with it. I'll give you the biting edge of my tongue and ask you to go and correct it. I've been strict and I remain strict because I hate hypocrisy. I want to be myself. I remain myself. And I'll tell you in your face very politely what I think about what you're doing and provide you an alternative as suggestively with humility. Mm -hmm. And that is I. Now, Prof, I mean, a lot of people have heard about your books. Now, if they want to find the book, where can they find them? Oh, I, I, I said, maybe didn't know where I was running over it too much. That I'm not interested in the money, Chrissy. No, it's not about the money. No, yes, People yes. Want to read they the want book. to read it. Where can they find the books? Uh, they'll find uh, copies of the Third Republic in libraries of um, Cape Coast University, Legon, Balm Library, and I believe Tech. This, and, and then... Um, Padmo Library. Padmo Library. Yes. Um, this one, I gave some lot to the Kingdom Bookshop. Mm -hmm. I don't know its status now, mm -hmm. but really, um, my interest is that you've left something for posterity, and that's enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Well, viewers, 
We've all listened to this conversation with Professor Nana Esriku Kundria. I've learned quite a bit about him. Uh, I've learned a lot about Ghana. And I've learned a few things about journalism. And I do hope that all of us who participated in this, those of us in the studio, cameramen, editors, and so on, and those of you at home, will all benefit somehow from this conversation. If we succeeded in making you benefit from this, we are most grateful. And if we didn't, which I doubt, we sincerely apologize. We'll see you again pretty soon. But before we see you, keep your dad on Pan-African television, where we bring you the best in news, best in current affairs, best in sports, best in entertainment, and best in everything. On behalf of my producer, director, Adam Lumo, cameraman, makeup artist, everybody, we say goodbye till we meet again very soon. Bye-bye.